Today is Epiphany, not just Epiphany Sunday, but the actual day of Epiphany, which is kind of fun because it doesn't always hit a Sunday. But this year we celebrate actual Epiphany on Sunday. And Epiphany is one of those great days where we have a little moment to unpack a detail of the story of Jesus' birth. Now, Christmas is a few weeks behind us. It might feel like it's still hung over us, but Christmas has been a while, and now we celebrate the arrival of the wise men from the East. Epiphany is really a day that throughout Christian history has been the moment when we celebrate the recognition of God in Christ, the recognition that Jesus, the person, the baby, the man, is something more than just any other man or any other prophet. These wise men see something divine in this person of Jesus. And we celebrate their recognition because it impacts the whole rest of Christian history. Now these wise men coming from the East are one of those favorite little images that we use, but I want to put them in historic context before we really get into the story. And this might be a little sad for some of you, but here we go. So tradition holds that the wise men from the East were certainly not Jewish. These men would have been from the area where Abraham was from. That would either be kind of East Iraq or what is today Iran. They are likely Persians, and they were almost certainly astrologers because the reason they showed up to the manger is because they saw a star. They saw that star and something shifted and changed and they realized a big thing was happening. And so they decided to follow that star and find out what was going on. Now these wise men were also almost certainly not kings. You know, we three kings, that's sweet and all, but they were probably just some wealthy guys. Wealthy enough to make a trip all the way from the east. And they were almost certainly not just three of them. Now, historically, we say three because we have those three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But it was probably a big caravan of people. They would have traveled a long way, and they would have had lots of helpers in their caravan, and there probably would have been more than three wise men who show up. And finally, one of those things about it is that we always see the image of the wise men showing up to see the newborn baby in the manger but it's probably been a couple years since Jesus was born when the wise men finally show up. If you really think about seeing the star and then making plans and then taking a long trip to find Jesus, it took more than, say, a month. And so these wise men show up, and we know that it's probably been a while because Herod ultimately will instruct his soldiers to execute children age two and younger, all of the boys. And so it's been a while because Jesus could be as old as two at this point. And so all that context is nice. I find all that kind of stuff interesting. But what really is the point of this story? The point of this story is that the wise men are on a journey of discovery. The wise men have seen something that perked them up and they decided to make a trip, to put forth some effort, to actually try and figure out what special thing is going on. That kind of journey of discovery is what most of us are on as disciples of Christ. As Christian people, we are all on some kind of journey of discovery. We, we show up here on Sundays, maybe we go to Bible studies, we join prayer groups, in order to continue to discover what God is doing in the world. God is doing amazing things in the world, and we, at least some part of us, want to be a part of that work. And so we go off and we put forth effort in order to discover what God is doing and how we can be a part of whatever work God is doing. That is good on its own. And I could stand up here and talk about discovery for another 10, 20, 30 minutes. You would love that. But instead, I want to focus on a part of the story that we often forget. The wise men went home. We like to focus on the wise men showing up to Jesus with their gifts. It's very sweet, and we get a good image of them handing over these gifts to this little child. But then they went home. Can you imagine what it was like to get home after having this experience? What in the world will they have told their spouses? 
or their own children or their friends about this long journey they took. Certainly people would have wanted to know, was it worth it? What did you find? What did you discover when you made that trip all the way to Bethlehem? What do you think they would have told them? How would they have described this experience, this incredible experience of showing up to witness the Christ child himself? What would you have said to your people? Perhaps even more important, what do you say to your people when you try to describe the discovery that you make about what God is doing in the world? Because you see, we all show up here searching for something. We all show up here expecting to experience something divine. And it may not be some high mountaintop experience every time we show up to church, but we do show up expecting to be touched in some way by the divine, to find God here in some way that will inspire us and change the way that we live. But it's not just about us, because we too, after we make our journey of discovery, go home. We leave this place. We walk out those doors and we go back to our regular life. And are we actually changed? Do we change something about the way we live because of what we have discovered about God's amazing work here in this place? Beyond that, do we actually tell people what we discovered. We are at the beginning of a new calendar year, and even though we started the church year a few weeks ago, this is really the new year for the world around us. And when we start a new year, it's appropriate for us to think about how things could be different. What are the ways that we at St. Michael could be different this year? I think one of our biggest challenges, and in fact, our biggest opportunity, has nothing to do with our resources or our vision or our abilities. Our biggest opportunity has to do with what we say to other people about what we have discovered in this place. What we actually say to the people out there in the real world about why we come in here and what we find when we do. Now, I haven't actually said the word resolution yet, but let's talk about resolutions. I really don't like resolutions. I'm really bad at them. But as I was watching on New Year's Eve, those tacky, hilarious New Year's Eve TV shows, do you all watch those? I love that stuff. You have, you have sort of like C-list celebrities that come out of the woodwork and they act like it's the best thing they've ever done, and they misspeak, and they say weird things, and it's, it's wonderful, it's delightful. As I was watching these shows, and they were talking to the people in Times Square where it was raining and cold, and why would you ever do that? But they're there, as they were interviewing and asking people what they're looking forward to next year. I was sort of struck by the regularity of hearing the same kind of message. They want next year to be better. Most people did not feel too great about 2018, which I thought was kind of interesting because I really like 2018 in my life. But apparently, 2018 has been pretty hard for a lot of people. And 2018, I think, has been hard for a lot of people because most people don't have a really good anchor of faith. It's no secret people don't really go to church as often as they should, or ever. And when you don't have an anchor of something beyond yourself, it is so easy to be sucked in to the negativity, sucked into the pessimism and the cynicism and the ugliness. And perhaps a resolution we could make, not just as individuals, but corporately as a church, is to begin to explicitly share the anchor of goodness and kindness and hope and love that we find here. You know, we show up here imperfectly, 
We show up here looking for that faith and that hope as well, but we show up here and most of the time we find it. A friend of mine says this is the best therapy she has all week because even though she may not really want to get up on a Sunday morning when she could sleep in, she shows up and she always feels better as she leaves. It's not cheap. What makes her feel better is because God is real and God is present. And when we come and we sit and we sing and we pray and we talk and we laugh and we hug each other, we feel better because we have that real sense of hope. Our resolution this year, in my opinion, should be committing to sharing that kind of hope outside of these walls. Because yes, we journey to discover God here, but we don't stay here. We go home. And when we go home, we encounter the people all around us who are adrift out in the world without the anchor they really need. As we look ahead at a new year, perhaps we, out of love and generosity and explicit kindness, can commit to leaving this place each week, leaving this place every time we come here, to make sure that we tell those around us and invite those we meet to come here and find the hope and the peace that they really need. It's a happy new year. When you go home, tell a friend. Amen.